Good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, turning up for the second uh, day, second evening of our seminar on healthcare as disobedience, uh, which we are organizing within the exhibition uh, Pirate Care, a survey of practices uh, in Galeria Nova in Zagreb with the support of Multimedia Institute and what, how, and for whom, whom we thank uh now for uh supporting both the exhibition and uh the organization of this seminar um tonight we have a small change of our roster uh madalena franito has unfortunately fallen ill upon her arrival to zagreb so uh we have had to move this panel uh fully online instead of streaming live from the gallery um i guess no difference to all of you watching uh from the comfort of your uh living room or wherever you might be uh however instead of madalena we'll have uh our own valeria graziano stepping in uh and delivering a talk on a piece of research she's doing so tonight with us we have uh sanya horvatincic uh as initially planned and Valeria Graziano uh, will go in the opposite order. Valeria will go first as she might need to leave earlier because of uh, childcare duties uh, and uh, Sanya uh, taking the mic second. Um, as we uh, said already in the announcement and, and yesterday, uh, the purpose of this seminar is to investigate historical instances of uh, organ organizing healthcare from bottom up uh, in situations of uh, conflict and uh, uh, contestations uh, and uh, to look at how such instances of uh, healthcare, bottom up healthcare organizing uh, have shaped and transformed uh, both healthcare provision, uh, the standard uh, of provision, but also the systems of healthcare provision, so uh, medical systems. Um, and while yesterday we have spent some time looking at uh, the transformation of psychiatry in Italy in 1970s, primarily looking at the example of uh, the asylum in Trieste, San Giovanni, uh, that uh, Franco Basaglia um, took over in the early 70s and uh, closed, uh, open to the community and shifted the entire provision of psychosocial care uh, into uh, the community where the afflicted um, uh, inmates and um, patients uh, after the closing of the yeah. asylum uh, were actually living and where they were uh, had sort of the network of support that they could uh, carry on uh, instead of being institutionalized. And then we also talked about uh, Greek uh, solidarity clinics that were set up in uh, 2010s uh, in response to uh, the Great Recession of 2008 and uh, the policy, austerity policies imposed by uh, the Troika uh, on uh, Greece. Uh, and we have, through talk of Pancharamas and uh, Christos Yovanopoulos, explored both the disobedience uh, and the commoning uh, in these two uh, historic instances. Uh, today's uh, session will focus on two other uh, historic historical moments. Uh, uh, Valeria will talk uh, about the work of uh, uh, oops, uh, Ivar Odone. Uh, she'll tell more about the person uh, whose work has uh, focused on um, organizing of workers around healthcare in factories and uh, a form of organizing that very much speaks to uh, the conditions of mass industrial labor in factories um, that afflicts uh, health of workers and communities uh, and defines, as Valeria well, yeah, yesterday pointed through the words of David Harvey, that uh, sort of the um, what defines 
health in, in uh, our society's primarily capacity to go to work. Um, and uh, Sanya will talk about the instance of uh, organizing medical services uh, within the context of uh, partisan warfare uh, in Yugoslavia uh, during the World War II. Uh, and uh, before I pass the microphone to Valeria, I will just uh, briefly introduce both Valeria and uh, Sanya. Um, Valeria is an independent researcher. Over the years, she has been involved in numerous initiatives of militant research and collective pedagogy across art institutions and social movements. Her research focuses on organizational practices and technopolitical technopolit tools that foster the refusal of work, the creative redistribution of social reproduction, and the politicization of pleasure. With Marcel Mars and Tomislav Medak, Valeria is convening pirate care. Sanya is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Art History in Zagreb. Her research focuses on modernist memorial sculpture and architecture and the production of history through cultural practices in socialist Yugoslavia. She employs critical and interdisciplinary approach to heritage to investigate contemporary potential of Yugoslavia, Yugoslav memorial structures and concepts. She is the coordinator of the international heritage project, Heritage from Below, Drezhnica, Traces and Memories 1941 to 1945, uh, of which I think her tonight's presentation is sort of result or uh, uh, part of. Um, you want to correct me, Sanya? No, I wanted to say it's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, okay, just before I hand over to uh, Valeria, uh, the, please keep your microphones muted for those who are on Zoom. Uh, we'll first have both presentations and then we'll have a Q&A session uh, uh, at the end. Um, so Valeria, please. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Tommy, for the introductions, for hosting. Thanks to Behar and Mama for organizing, and hi to Sanya. I really look forward to hear uh, your material tonight. So I will speak about a bit about um, what Tommy said, the work of uh, a particular doctor and activist uh, based in Italy, active in Italy uh, from the 70s, 60s, sorry, uh, onwards, uh, he unfortunately passed away in 2010, Iva Rodone. Although uh, I would like to say uh, briefly that uh, I'm always a bit uncomfortable in this uh, storytelling that starts with a big man. <laughs> uh, maybe we need less of these kind of uh, narrations. Uh, so I hope it, it won't be a, hopefully a, a one person centered story but uh, Ivar Rodone, for once, he was someone who was really passionate in trying to theorize a new kind of expanded scientific community, what made of what he called nodal men that could actually um, produce connections between different experiences in life, different knowledges, uh, social work, workers, doctors, uh, factory workers, uh, and so forth and so on. So uh, he would have probably agreed that uh, this story should be um, named in the plural. Um, so Ivaro Dona was, uh, however, one of the protagonists of a season in Italy that opens with the post-war, well, it opens actually during the partisan years of the resistance to, to fascism in the country, but it really explodes in the post-war years. And um, although I am Italian, I would like to share this story again as a maybe more of a collective story that uh, could benefit our translocal, transnational uh, repertoire. Uh, repertoire of narrations that might help us to think what kind of health we can imagine today for ourselves. And this is a very thick and, and uh, difficult, intractable problem uh, today in, in many ways. So Italy, I was saying, it might be an interesting place to start. Uh, because it was within uh, the Western European area, geographic area, the second country that actually managed to obtain uh, free and universal healthcare. 
So a model of healthcare that is based on general taxation, okay? And that is uh, leaving behind a model that was the prevalent one for um, uh, health systems before that, which was often uh, based on corporativism or mutual aid societies. But anyway, the link between your work st status and the kind of care you could have access to was pretty much at the center of the uh, previous model. So. Um, Italy gets uh, the um, national healthcare system in 78, which is quite late. The first country who had it was uh, the UK, the uh, England in um, uh, right after the war. Um, and, and this was pretty much a result of uh, over 20 years, I would say, of, of struggles and patient kind of connecting different, um, different struggles, some of them, as, men, as mentioned by Tommy and Pancho uh, was narrating this uh, yesterday, had to do with mental health or started there to redefine our concept of health. Other uh, struggles had to do with different segments. Um, what Madalena was going to cover, Madalena Franito was not with us, was going to talk about was another segment of this story uh, that belongs to um, epidemiology and the, uh, the modeling of data also and, and for, for medicine, something that is very much current uh, today in, in a different shape. Okay, so this was a bit uh, to just give you some flavor for the context of this figure of Iva Rodone, who is also not so uh, well remembered as he should probably within the Italian uh, speaking context. Um, he was uh, also, I must say, a very active uh, partisan, so maybe this can be a nice link and segue to what Sanya will, will share uh, later on this evening. And uh, after the end of the war, uh, he uh, starts his practice as a, as a physician, as a, med as a doctor. Uh, he was uh, pretty much a pioneer in what is now called occupational medicine, which basically looks at the links between health hazards and uh, fatigue and accidents and uh, ergonomics and all this kind of group of conditions linked with uh, working activities. Um, but he did so from a very positioned, uh, politically positioned perspective. So it's very far away from some kind of occupational medicine that we hear of uh, today that pretty much seems to be very much aligned with uh, extracting more productivity from the bodies of those who work. Uh, his approach was uh, very much different. Um, he was a long-standing member of the Communist Party, and he was very much informed with, uh, by Gramscian ideas of uh, how to organize. And he was also very much involved with the uh, CGL, which is uh, one of the largest uh, trade unions uh, in the country. Now, until the 60s, the main way uh, trade unions would think about health uh, hazards in work for uh, factory workers was through a model that uh, we call in Italian monetizzazione, monetization. So pretty much the union would try to negotiate for more money, right? If you were exposed to some kind of danger or hazard uh, toxicity, if you were working in bad conditions. And uh, Odone was one of the key practitioners that basically puts a stop to this and starts to collaborate from the from 61 really uh, with the union to elaborate a different strategy, what could be a better claim around health. So the principle becomes that uh, out the, the, the motto of the, of the workers and, and also that what union passes is that our health is not for sale. So there are no more negotiations around how much can you pay somebody's somebody getting a tumor in their lungs or uh, getting injured. Um, just to give you a sense of the, um, uh, again, of the context of Italy in the, in the 70s and 60s. Um, today, the country has an average of three deaths uh, of work, uh, at work uh, per day, which is still quite significant. Uh, and around 800,000 injuries per year. But in the 60s, what we're looking at is uh, three deaths every two hours and one accident per minute. 
So in the decade between the 50s and the 70s, we have almost 100,000 deaths. So when we th think about class struggle and class war in, in this sense, it was pretty much almost a literal uh, kind of translation of what that feels like. So Eva Rodona, I would like to share in, in yeah, the next 10 minutes or so, uh, two of his uh, main uh, interventions. Uh, um, th that also resulted in two publications that maybe I can quickly share also with my screen. So I can, uh, let's see, I can give you something to consider. Um, is this visible? Is it working? The screen share, yes, but this. I. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Tom. Okay, so the first publication, it's a um, handbook. It's very much a manual called L'Ambiente di Lavoro. Uh, it was published in 1969 as a tool for uh, unions to become able to speak about uh, health measures within the work environment by pretty much centering the figure of the experience of the workers themselves. And this is pretty much a, a, a very clever way to classify what goes on in factories, in workplaces that are also post-industrial, but um, pretty much mapping everything that goes in and goes out. And that is not the official narrative of just capital and work force getting in and then some profit and products getting out. Um, Odone pretty much proposes a method that became standard uh, practice of, for union inquiries with workers ac across the world. I think this was translated in uh, roughly six or seven languages and adopted uh, uh, in Latin America, it was very influential in Brazil for struggles there. I know it has been translated in Japanese. Anyhow, it had its own afterlife, which would be uh, very interesting to map and see how other contexts work with this. But pretty much this model um, divides the factors of uh, hazard into four categories. The first group being climatic factors, so temperature, ventilation, humidity, uh, things such as noise or, or, or levels of light, so excessive light or, uh, or darkness. Second group uh, pretty much maps chemical, uh, chemical factors such as uh, toxic chemicals, dust, fumes, vapors, that kind of thing. The third looks at uh, sheer physical uh, labor and the effects on the body and strains it puts on joints, bones, muscles, posture, and the like. And in the fourth group, uh, O'Donnell proposed that the workers themselves have conversations and map the psychic components of toxicity in their work environments, including uh, excessive monotony, monotony, repetition, um, anxiety, too much responsibilities or too little, basically, like too much stimulation or, or too little stimulation. Mm. What's uh, interesting and uh, revealing of the kind of, uh, I think, political complexity of that moment is that as early as, as in 69, Odone is already suggesting that the tendency for work environments is to shrink the first three orders of uh, hazard, of, of uh, damaging, uh, that, yeah, like uh, to uh, toxicity uh, and climatic problems or, or physical strain. And he predicts that uh, the um, employees, the employers will really push for the fourth category in the coming years. So the factors of stress and mental uh, fa fatigue and toxicity will increase. So that was his, his position. Um, yeah, so th this is where he conducted uh, his uh, workers inquiry. Um, 
because at the time I should maybe say this, this is a Fiat plant, Cari Mirafiori uh, in Torino, which is where the city where Odone was, uh, was based. And he would like travel with his Vespa and stop at the factory gates and trying to engage workers in conversations to begin with. Uh, obviously nobody was not a, a worker of Fiat cars uh, themselves was allowed inside. So there was no way for even medical doctors to assess the actual conditions uh, in which the workers were uh, were um, kind of embedded for eight or plus hours per, per shift. And um, the second experience that I wanted to quickly share, and there would be so much to, to say about uh, this, but um, maybe in the discussion, we can get back to some issues, um, is a second uh, body of work that Odone contributed to together with Alessandra Re and Gianni Briante, but also, and this does not show in this uh, cover that I have here, with uh, 15 other workers of Fiat car in uh, 1973. And this book is uh, title could be translated as uh, Workers Experience, Class Consciousness and Psychology of Work. Now, uh, I've been, uh, what I will share now, I also should thank uh, somebody who was one of the Fiat workers that Odone worked with to produce uh, this uh, body of work, uh, this body of theory, who is called Gianni Marchetto. And in case he's connected, I say hi and thank you to him because uh, he has been extremely generous in, in narrating uh, what, what that process looked like. So, as I mentioned, there was a real lack of data and possibilities for first-hand investigations into the, uh, the, the problems within the environment of, of work of, of these people. So um, Eva Rodone working with uh, about a dozen of uh, Fiat uh, workers begins to wonder how to put in dialogue or how to construct um, a technique, a language really, uh, for translating the experience of, of those who were at Mirafiori for eight hours a day making cars and, and engines. And the, the militant doctors that wanted to start to problematize the, the hazards and the toxicities of that place. There was a problem, of course, of class, but also regional dialects, all kinds of stuff contributed so that these people, like the doctor would ask a question and the, and the worker would absolutely uh, give an answer that would not fit the, the doctor's expectations and so forth and so on. So they were chasing their own tail for a while. And at some point, Odone came up with what he named the technique of the, uh, of the instructions to the double or the doppelganger as you prefer to translate, um, which is a very performative technique. And uh, because of my background in, in performance studies, I'm, I'm very interested in that. So the proposal of, the, of Odone is, it was to say, okay, stop, let, let's, not, let's, not not, let's not do storytelling around your workplace. What I would like you to do now is to give me instructions as if I look like you, and as if tomorrow I was able to replace you at work, but you need to give me instru enough instructions about your typical work day so that I would be able to fool everyone in thinking that I'm really you, okay? And in, this, in the story that Johnny was sharing, um, this, um, this process was of course, first of all, hilarious and they had a lot of fun doing it and they were, also repeating it in rehearsals because the, the factory workers themselves, apparently they really loved a good old socialist rant. So they would tend to go and theorize on uh, the, the broader political problems and picture. And, and these, these instructions to the double became a good tool to always bring back the conversation to very, very materialist, pragmatic problems that could be addressed and brought. Uh, to push for in negotiations. So in the instructions to the double are um, organized in four different, uh, um, sorry, I can maybe stop the uh, screen share. Okay. 
they were basically organized uh, to map the individual worker experience um, across four relations plus one. The first relation would, was uh, the relation with the machine and the job description to highlight the, ten, like the tension between the plan in the engineer's minds, the ones that would uh, time workers and decide the movements that, were had to, uh, that they would have to perform. The second relation was with hierarchy, so the bosses. And again, uh, the objective there is to see uh, what is the, uh, you know, are you, what kind of relation one has with one boss, if it's about, you know, uh, trying to please them or if, if it's a con conflictual uh, place of work. The third relation uh, that they would, uh, give instructions around uh, where relations with colleagues and peers and comrades. And the fourth dimension would map their relation with the organizations. And by this, they mean, uh, of course, political organizations, they, typically the union and, and the party. And so to this uh, four basic relations that were how this uh, storytelling, these instructions were, were given, they also added a final one, which was the, the background, the biography of the person, you know, what other jobs did they have? What, what, where were they from? What was the occupation of their family? Were they married and, and so forth and so on. So out of this four plus one dimensions, um, it became possible to produce a, like a really um, precise and very, really useful knowledge to, to quote, um, of the conditions of labor that allowed for, uh, for a number of, of, of things to happen. Uh, and I, I will just like end by describing maybe a cup, like one anecdote uh, that sums it up. So in one of the instructions that got published in the book uh, is by someone called Cesare Cosi. And in his, um, in his instructions, basically, we find out that the teams of workers, you know how a uh, factory chain work is organized at the time, it was in teams of work, um, there could be average of 10, 15 men. And it, we're talking about very like physically heavy kind of uh, motions, uh, but they would devise these techniques for um, either speeding up or most typically slowing down production, but then being able to recuperate so that the whole team could get more time for breaks to go for a cigarette or a coffee or do a bit of political organizing, whatever they wanted to, to do. The key to this though, was that every member of the team was to be on board and had to be trained on how to cheat the system. And this was particularly tricky because Fiat cars management would rotate people because they were afraid of politicization. So every couple of months, some people would be uh, removed and, and the teams would be remixed. So they had devised a number of ways to pass on this tacit knowledge from one person to the other and kind of train each other. So this, that this uh, kind of little moment of collective health could be uh, preserved. And there's many other stories that come out from, from, the, from the interviews, but I think, um, I think this gives you a gist of, of, the, of the kind of things that they were able to start mapping. Um, so yeah, I think I will stop here and hoping that uh, this can be just like, again, a sharing of stories and experiences that is probably not reproducible elsewhere as such, but that it could maybe inspire um, a way to think around um, organizing for health that moves away, I suppose, this is what I would like to end on, that moves away, and I think we need this, from a notion of health as uh, either the ability to work, as Tommy was talking about, but also as a moral quality. We, we are really into this moment when taking care of one's own health has become such an individualized, uh, activity or either that or something that can be purchased almost through an endless stream of new 
novelty products. Uh, and, and what emerges from uh, this um, moment in Italy when the healthcare movements were at their peak, imagining um, healthcare services and health practices was really that healthcare is best grasped, uh, sorry, that health could be best grasped as a byproduct, a byproduct in the, that lives in the nexus of, as Odone mapped it, work conditions. So not just uh, the conditions of the workers, but also the toxicity of the products being made, of course. And this leads to the environmental question. So the environment of the title of the book, the environment of work also refers to the broader environment and they would map also territories and neighborhoods and, and we're really close to um, early uh, kind of ecological activism and uh, the collective social psycho dimension of uh, wellness that he was identifying as this fourth group of factors that he thought would escalate. So the nexus between production and work environment and collectivity and, and sociality, uh, that's where health can emerge as a byproduct. Uh, yeah, I, I think I can stop here. Thank you, Valeria. Um, let's hope that you can stick around. Um, that was highly intriguing and I'm sure there will be uh, lots of uh, questions and uh, maybe questions related to uh, detailing a bit more. Uh, Sanya, if you can uh, take a stand now. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Valeria, uh, this was very uh, interesting. Uh, I'm also excited to see how these two stories will uh, come together. Um, so as uh, Tom already uh, announced, uh, and thank you, Tom, for this, uh, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to speak uh, mainly about the organization of the healthcare system as part of the people's liberation struggle in former Yugoslavia and the territory of former Yugoslavia. But also uh, I'm going to touch upon certain other aspects that uh, I find relevant. Um, so I'm gonna share I'm going to share this uh, my screen just a second to have this visual background. Let's put this full screen. And first of all, I want to say that this lecture is uh, mainly based on several years of my interest and uh, my fascination with the partisan organization in the liberated territories during the Second World War. Um, the interest that came from my research uh, on, on basically different models and strategies of memorialization in socialist Yugoslavia in the post-war period. So to understand the relevance of the sites marked by some of the most elaborate monuments in former Yugoslavia, or the work on the preservation and musealization of the material, material remains of such sites, um, like wooden hospital barracks or tents on civilian, shel civilian shelters or print houses, uh, it was necessary and still is for me uh, to dive into the vast and complex history of um, these partisan activities. Uh, there is a lot of literature, fortunately, uh, written already on the topic of what is usually referred to as partisan um, sanitation, military sanitation, sanitet. Um, and uh, I will uh, give an elaborate uh, list of literature at the end, and there is a uh, there is an intention and a, I hope uh, uh, a doable project of compiling the literature and digitizing it and making it available online uh, through, uh, through the memory of the world in future. Uh, mm, I also have to say at the beginning that I'm going to use a lot of photographic images uh, in the presentation um, and most of which I scanned from the secondary literature. Mm, and I didn't credit all of them. I didn't even describe all of the images. I'm going to talk about them. Uh, but if anyone is interested in the origin of the images or um, the credits for them, uh, please um, ask. Um, I also want to thank to uh, my dear colleague, Natasha Matausic, um, 
for making me uh, available some of the materials that were used uh, in the former Museum of the Revolution for uh, exhibitions uh, on partisan healthcare uh, in the period of socialism. Um, so in my presentation, uh, so basically I'm going to, do, to, 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 to divide this talk in three parts. Uh, in the first one, I'm going to talk about the history and characteristics of the reorganization of healthcare uh, and military sanitation in Yugoslavia, uh, with a somewhat stronger emphasis on the territory of Croatia because of the availability of material for me. Then secondly, I'm going to talk about the, touch upon basically about the um, post-war memory of these events um, and the legacy, political legacy of healthcare uh, system. And then finally, I'm going to finish with a case study of a critical heritage approach that investigates the potential of materiality of partisan healthcare system uh, in, uh, in the surroundings of the village of Grezhnitz in Croatia. But let's, more, uh, let's, let's start now with a more immersive experience. I would say that it's, uh, it's an article um, um, that is basically a report, a journalist report published in the ninth issue of the newspaper Primorka. Uh, that was printed in August 1943, um, most probably in the Central Technique of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Croatia near Drežnica. Uh, Primor Primorka was published by the District Committee of the Anti-Fascist Front of Women for Croatian Literal, and it continually was published from 42 to 45. So I'm going to read most of the, the text um, and translate it to English. So our hospital, um, the, the title of the article is uh, Our Hospital. Our hospital is in the forest. We are very curious to see it. We want to know where it's situated, what are living conditions like, how it is like for patients, for those who are healing them and who are healed. The paths are crossing more and more often, but we are now getting very close, the, guys, the guide tells us. And indeed, all of a sudden behind the greenery, a building appears, a beautiful wooden one story high, our hospital. The hospital is surrounded by life. The cart that transports dirty clothes of the wounded and patients have just returned. They need to be disinfected to eliminate chances of infection. Our wooden comrades smile to us behind the glass windows. It's the room for those who need recovery. A row of tidy beds and numerous streamed heads and smiling faces. A nurse awaits us at the entrance, happy to show us how much they have achieved in setting up the hospital. In the ground and first floor, there is altogether six rooms for the wounded and sick. Everything is tidy and clean. We were not allowed to enter the rooms, just greet them from the doorstep. The white scraps of the doctor comrades and nurses remind us of the occupied territories. On the, on the one hand, it's because we thought that only there the doctors can wear white scrubs. On the other, because three, uh, uh, these scrubs, I'm sorry, were brought here with the help of the occupied rare. This is what is a posadina, the rare, the, uh, the occupied uh, uh, the organization in the occupied areas. On each step on the hospital, in the hospital, we are encountering bond between our occupied positions and our liberated territory. In the kitchen, a number of portions with cutleries prepared for lunchtime. For us, this presents the achievements of our actions when we transported hundreds of those food portions to the hospital. Uh, on another table, we see folded laundry. Again, those are the countless packages carried from towns and under the barbed wire to the mountain's peak, peaks in hands and on the backs of our female comrades and youth. We are now guided towards the pharmacy. The comrade in charge of this task proudly tells us that ours is the best supplied pharmacy in the Central Europe. We are wondering, but who supplies you with all this special material? The answer is the People's Liberation Council for Primaria. And now women from Primaria are proud because we see once again how our minute rare labor, the, this rare term is Liz Posadinsky the, the, from the occupied areas, like running around, such as running, running around from shop to shop has a huge importance when its results are gathered and visible all at one place. We ask them about the water supply. That's their biggest problem. They have to transport water from afar on horses. Yet everything needs to be washed and clean. The laundry is washed by young women 
and members of the anti-fascist front of women from the nearby villages. On top of that, they also come every week to wash and clean their hospital and bring more water. Water is also collected from the roof, from the roof in large barrels. The commerce are finding different ways of managing the situation, all due to the all due to keep the hospital safe from the enemy. Because the points in the forest with water springs are marked on the maps, so the enemy can beat them. This is uh, most of the article that I wanted to uh, share with you. Um, and, um, <laughs> And so the author behind this text is indicated by the acronym at the end, uh, ZZV, was Veda Zagorac, <clears throat> who was at the time a member of the Anti-Fascist anti Front of um, Women. So she was born in 1914 in a small village of Vania uh, with her name, with her birth name, Cvieta Djurgica Zagorac. Uh, educated in Zagreb, studied philosophy and economics in the 30s, and became a member of the Union of the Communist Youth, Youth of Yugoslavia already in 1934. In 1936, she became a party member. She was one of Tito's closest collaborate, collaborates in that period. <clears throat> she went to Paris in 1937 to organize the transport of volunteers to Spain, where they took part in Spanish Civil War. In Paris, she met Jela Jancic, the founder and the political commissar of the partisan hospital number seven at Mount Javarnica and Drežnica, the same hospital she visited in sum summer 1943 and reported on in Primorka, I just read. However, at the time of her visit in August 1943, Yela was, already, was no longer uh, in that position uh, or in that hospital. She left only a month or two before that. Veda, uh, Veda Zagoras, uh, Zagoras was Sveta Djurgica's illegal partisan names, which, is it, which she decided to keep throughout her life. She continued her political work in Yugoslavia and abroad, organizing resistance in, uh, in Algier with women and in other African countries that fought anti-colonial wars. She spent several post-war decades um, in, different African con uh, in different African countries with her husband, uh, Zravko Pečar, who was an ambassador, Yugoslav ambassador to those countries, and with women, and with whom um, she later founded the Museum of African Art in Belgrade in late 1970s. The continuities of revolutionary work of women, from their work in Zagreb to Sp Spain through people's liberation struggle, and then in the anti-colonial wars during the non-aligned movement, is a topic that requires more attention and research. Both Yela and Veda wanted to go to fight in Spain in the 30s, but were more useful, useful in organizing the, re, the rare resistance organization, class and communication and political networks. That role in the resistance offer performed by women was sometimes omitted, omitted in post-war historization, or at least not valued adequately or equally, as was the case with the armed struggle. These activ activities that were required for the supply of the hospital finally become visible and evident in all those meals, folded linens and medicines in the best supplied pharmacy in Central Europe in the white scrap the girls smuggled from the liberated territory. Here I can already pose the question, how can these narratives become more visible and meaningful for us today when we are faced with both historical revisionism and neo neoliberal, uh, neoliberal ideology that leads to devastation of the very concept of public health or to complete distrust, distrust in medical expertise and publicly organized healthcare. But Veda's bio biography is relevant from different angles exactly because she wasn't a partisan nurse like majority of women whom she wrote about and wanted to politically organize and emancipate. It's clear, it's clear from how her report from the hospital is framed. She is looking for a way to make the, the products of women background labor activities visible and to show cru how crucial their work is in the whole complex system of resistance. Her pre-war political activism is equally relevant as it tells us what sort of 
fragmentary work may be similar to what we are facing today preceded the organization of healthcare during the Yugoslav resistance as part of the people's liberation struggle and socialist revolution. Many progressive languishing social actors were engaged in pro providing public health care in the 1930s. For example, architects and urban planners saw their own professional engagement as part of that agenda. Uh, taking care of the raising social standards for the majority of the people, etc. Left-wing political parties, mainly the Communist Party uh, of Croatia, uh, of uh, Yugoslavia, um, although proscribed by the law, actively, pu actively pushed the agenda of education through health uh, healthcare courses. Um, many women were included in Red Cross and other organizations aimed at strengthening solidarity in healthcare. Also, um, in her work in France in relation to Spain, I'm talking still about Veda Zagorac uh, from the perspective of her biography, um, was um, uh, important uh, as it tells us a lot about also how women participated in that resistance, but also reminds us of the fact that 18 women from Yugoslavia were part uh, of this um, uh, of the struggle against fascism uh, in uh, uh, Spain in 1930s, uh, and that their biographies uh, were very much uh, forgotten. Uh, so now I'm going to. Um, uh, talk about um, the beginning of the organization of the uh, uh, of the healthcare as part of the resist uh, uh, resistance movement in former Yugoslavia. As many of you know, um, and I'm not going to talk about the wider historical context of the beginning of the Second World War, but it is important to remind ourselves that um, from the very beginning um, there was a very uh, a clear uh, idea and political uh, organization standing behind the resistance uh, with the horizon, with the political horizon um, that defined it as a socialist revolution throughout the following five years. Um, and uh, the main strategy and tactics uh, of this resistance struggle was based on, uh, firstly, on guerrilla warfare, uh, but mainly on uh, uh, securing uh, liberated territories um, as long as possible and uh, making those territories as big as possible. This was very important for the organization of the healthcare system uh, because it needed the secure points um, in the rare system, in the system that was uh, liberated, um, to have a stability uh, of, uh, of uh, the system and to make the dynamics, the communication between the front lines and the rare um, um, uh, productive. Uh, so the liberated territories were very uh, dynamically changing throughout the years, uh, depending on the larger um, geopolitical situation uh, during the, this uh, global conflict. Uh, but there was a continuity of securing uh, liberated territories, uh, and they were main, mainly concentrated in the areas uh, that also had uh, natural predispositions or geo, 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 even geological predispositions for um, uh, hiding and for guerrilla warfare. Um, so the maps could basically overlap because the the, the hospitals, uh, especially those hospitals that were um, in the rare, um, that were uh, uh, hospitals for um, um, uh, for longer uh, uh, periods, that were intended for longer periods of time for, for the patients to stay in and to uh, recover, uh, were mainly located in the areas that were liberated. Uh, and those were often mountain, mountainous, uh, inaccessible areas. Uh, and this is also the areas where uh, uh, some of these areas that uh, managed to be uncovered for the whole period of the Second, uh, of the Second World War. Uh, what is important to say when we are looking at this map is that uh, we are looking at different types of hospitals, but the overall number that has been counted um, carefully uh, in the post-war historization process 
uh, was 573. Um, but we uh, are also having uh, here in the picture the uh, the bigger hospitals, the smaller segments, some of the hospitals that were located in the existing uh, infrastructure and the newly built infra infrastructure. Uh, so in that way, it is um, gonna maybe, yeah, skip to this one first. So maybe now it is also uh, instructive to see this organization scheme uh, that the partisan hospitals were basically uh, mainly divided into the stationary or territorial hospital for all uh, units of a given area. This is like military units, partisan military units, and they could be temporary or permanent, and then also public and secret. Public means that they were open, that they were known of from the uh, civilian population in that area. Uh, and this was functioning in the case when the civilian uh, population was uh, collaborating with the partisans. Uh, otherwise, and in cases of uh, higher secrecy, uh, these hospitals were more um, clandestine. So not uh, so only certain members of the movement, of the People's Liberation Movement, uh, were aware of them. Uh, and then there were also mobile hospitals that were belonging to uh, individual uh, units. So it is a very vast and complex system. Uh, and this system complicates uh, and becomes more elaborate with time uh, and with the progression of the organization within the partisan um, movement itself. So uh, the structure in 1942 defined by the status uh, of the medical uh, service in 42 um, is a bit more complex. Uh, it is the scheme is also showing us how um, defined and how hierarchized this uh, system was. And then in, for example, January 45, we have an even more elaborate uh, elaborate structure that is basically already a trans, uh, it's like a, a transition period already to the, uh, to the system of the healthcare in the in the uh, post-war period, no? um, when uh, the, the military aspect and the civilian aspect are uh, kind of uh, more separate. Uh, and um, regarding these uh, structures and the development of these structures, it's important to 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 know to to to, to say that there were two uh, main events uh, that defined. Uh, those uh, and other decisions regarding the healthcare. This was the first Congress of Yugoslav Partisan Phys Physicians in Bosanski Petrovac in September 42, when this uh, scheme that I ju just showed you was defined and when all different types of um, decisions were made regarding uh, the political um, uh, the, 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 the political aspect of the uh, medical health care, how political aspects were included in the healthcare, and how um, also on the organizational level things were supposed to uh, happen. Uh, and then we have the first Congress of Creation Physician, uh, Partisan Phys Physicians in uh, Glina um, uh, Topusko and Sluin. Uh, it was taking place in different uh, towns because of the attacks uh, in February 44, when we also have a very elaborate uh, um, Congress, a program already now uh, focusing on presenting uh, the medical expertise and the, med and the medical experience shared among uh, the physicians. So it was not only about the organizational uh, uh, issues, but it was already a kind of a professional meeting with exchanging knowledge and practical experience on how to work in the conditions of, um, uh, of the partisan warfare. Uh, and these, the, the, these uh, presentations, that the, the, they were luckily preserved. There is literature on that as well. And we can see here that the physicians are already thinking about the future. They're already thinking about what is their role in the future socialist society. And this is quite striking. And it is also telling in terms of how uh, this system um, you know, managed to um, in, imagine the horizon. Of the new, uh, of the new uh, social um, uh, and political system, where healthcare would have a completely different, uh, different uh, role, uh, that would function differently. Uh, 
Uh, but let's go back a bit because we also want to know what is going on in the occupied, in the most of the country, which is occupied at the time. So in Zagreb, in the, in the, in the capital of the independent state of Croatia, which was a fascist puppet state um, in the Axis um, forces. Um, there is a number of laws, first of all, that needs to be mentioned that were uh, basically nationalizing the medical supplies and that were putting everything in the service of the new fascist government. So things were regularized and there were laws same as there were laws for uh, persecuting minorities, uh, there were laws uh, that were controlling the supply, uh, the supplies that were controlling the health system as well. Um, and in that uh, way, we can also talk about what is disobedience. Uh, of course, in this extreme uh, circumstances, uh, it was basically uh, every kind of uh, offering of understanding healthcare as a common uh, was disobedience. Uh, and um, uh, it was thus also uh, kind of easier uh, to have uh, professionals on the side of the resistance because in a way their own professional uh, ethics was uh, conflicted under this kind of extreme uh, situation of the fascist occupation. Um, here is an interesting map um, done for one of these exhibitions in the Museum of Revolution in, uh, uh, in Zagreb uh, that is showing a number of checkpoints in Zagreb, the occupied Zagreb, that were part of the system of supplying and smuggling material from Zagreb. So basically it's important to say that uh, in order for the partisan healthcare to, to function, and they didn't have anything uh, on them, uh, they needed to um, uh, extract material from the occupied territories in different ways. It was very often done by buying materials, donating materials from the uh, occupied territories and then smuggling them to the liberated territories. Or it was done by um, uh, by so-called so war trophies. No, when uh, a town would be liberated, uh, then all of the uh, facilities related to health uh, system uh, would be uh, taken over, and the materials would be extracted and um, taken, transported to the partisan hospitals in the Muslim forest. Uh, there is. There were also sometimes um, interesting cases of, although uh, physicians and medical service uh, professionals were often joining uh, partisan and resistance movement uh, by freely leaving uh, the occupied uh, uh, towns, um, it was not easy to do so. Uh, it wasn't easy to leave. Uh, uh, to leave. Uh, Zagreb, for example, with no uh, consequences. Uh, so it was also needed to have like a system of checkpoints and uh, passing uh, of the ide fake identifications, etc., to leave. Sometimes there were also cases of hijacking doctors. This is very interesting. Uh, in several uh, towns, uh, there was this situation that basically um, they were hijacked, why either purposeful, either uh, really hijacked, or they were staging hijacking in order for, uh, for uh, these doctors and med medical service to be uh, taken out of the, uh, out of the cities. Um, so concerning the infrastructure of the partisan hospitals, as I already mentioned, there is this vast uh, typology of the hospital in terms of its function within the system of healthcare, but also on the very um, practical um, level, the building of these uh, infrastructure was also very uh, diverse. Uh, it depended obviously on the materials available uh, and the level of security of, this, of the liberated territories. So in the higher, um, um, in the more, let's say, uh, distant um, areas, uh, mostly in forests and mountains, there was a, a possibility to build, uh, build a more um, solid structures, uh, real huts, usually made of, um, uh, of wood, 
and usually remind, usually basically uh, um, drawing upon the experience of building such houses in vernacular architecture of those areas. And obviously local population, the experts in building such houses were employed and engaged in these activities and they very often, uh, and it, yeah, it, it, it is, uh, um, it has been noted that uh, they could do such houses like this one on the right up, um, which you see in a few days. Um, but there were also more modest structures, temporary structures, just like shelters, um, and also infrastructure that was taken from, for example, Italian camps and, uh, and used as tents, as you can see, but also um, interesting uh, ways of hiding uh, and sheltering the wounded underground, literally in the dugouts. And there are many um, um, interesting uh, memoirs uh, written on the experience of surviving underground in the dugouts with the wounded people with like 30 or 40 people in a dugout uh, for a few days lacking food and, and water etc. Um, also an interesting aspect is um, uh, the secrecy. So I'm going to read a quote from the diary of the uh, Lindsay Rogers, who was um, uh, uh, a foreign uh, medical expert in Yugoslavia joining partisans, uh, who said, uh, who wrote in, in his memoir, elaborate precautions were taken not to leave a trail from the pickup locations to the hospitals themselves. In summer, part uh, of the uh, in summer, part of the paths were rooted across rocky ledges, in following stream in flowing streams or on logs placed on stones and removed as soon as an incoming or departing group has crossed. Most covered stones were turned upside down for people to step on, then returned to their undisturbed mossy sides. In winter. Mm, easily followed tracks in the snow were a major problem. Uh, false trails were often made. Junctions with the secret routes to the hospitals would be carefully hidden by evenly tramping down the snow onto the natural contours, then uh, sifting new snow over the packed and smoothed surface. The Germans and white guards often used dogs to follow human scents, to throw them off an arm or leg that had been amputated in the hospital was dragged along false trails. When the patients were well enough to leave, they were blindfolded and led out of the hidden area so that they would never tell any, uh, that they, would, they would never tell under German torture the location of the hospital they had been in. Most of the hospitals survived detection, although a few were discovered. I and other officers with the other partisan groups reported that in those cases, the wounded were murdered in their bunks and the hospitals burned on top of them. So here you can also see uh, some models uh, that are showing the, this uh, elaborate system of hiding the trails and hiding uh, the infrastructure underground. Um, also hiding supplies um, for pharmacy uh, under the trees or like hiding the locations with the fake tree uh, or having some kind of natural cupboards uh, for hiding uh, the pharmacy. And with this note, we can also talk about the pharmacy uh, as a relevant aspect, uh, as one of the crucial aspects and uh, mention the fact that uh, although most of the pharma pharmaceutical products were taken from the, from the occupied territories, uh, basically um, uh, yeah, uh, exported from there uh, and used in the hospitals, um, uh, at some point uh, later in during, like in 43 and 44, uh, they become, uh, they start producing their own uh, simple medical uh, supplies and medicines um, and um, also uh, producing uh, medical instruments and pharmaceutical instruments 
uh, from the recycled materials. For example, you can see uh, you can see here the bottles with the partisan inscriptions on them, and you can also see the little uh, vessel for uh, grinding uh, the medicines and the perhaps uh, some bot botanical supplies uh, that was made from from a recycled airplane or an airplane. Um, uh, obviously, women were uh, also in majority in these uh, professions, uh, but I can also talk about that a bit later. Um, an important element uh, of this whole uh, system was also educating new staff. So there was a lack of professional uh, and, and educated doctors, physicians. So there was a continuous education programs uh, for nurses and also for a higher level of professional um, uh, ex uh, extracting, uh, trans, yeah, uh, passing over professional knowledge, um, uh, theoretical and practical. Uh, and another um, element is also uh, institu institutionalizing the profession um, by, uh, making journals by publishing journals uh, that were healthcare, um, that were dealing with the healthcare system uh, and with the more professional um, findings uh, um, and uh, the exchange of knowledge, uh, also practical um, advice and practical instructions on how to build um, medical um, uh, instruments, etc. And uh, another uh, important uh, element in, uh, in the functioning of, in the functioning of the healthcare uh, was uh, the production of um, textile uh, and cleaning of the textile to, for the sanitation use. Uh, that was mainly done, done by women, the, the civilian women in the um, in the villages surrounding the partisan the location of the partisan hospitals. Um, and also uh, recycling the system of recycling um, textile, for example, from uh, the silk uh, parachutes uh, that uh, which which with which they could uh, that they were receiving the uh, the aid from the allies. Um, obviously, also the supply supply of the uh, system of the uh, hospital was dependent on the on the organization of women, mainly women, because men were mostly in uh, mobilized in the units, the women in um, the surrounding areas of the hospitals, who uh, incredibly uh, in an incredibly elaborate way organized uh, to uh, schedule. Uh, the bringing of different types of food to the hospitals during a week uh, or a, a month period. Um, so it was not just like a random, uh, uh, a random uh, gestures of uh, solidarity, but it was a very organized system, mainly supervised by the anti-fascist front of women. Um, and also, uh, this is closely related to the organization of the information uh, on the, the service, information service and cultural services in the hospitals. Um, hospitals were uh, 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 location uh, were, were uh, places where some of the wounded and the patients spent uh, a lot of time. And there was a free time. There was also a need to... Um, uh, to work with them uh, in uh, the pa in the free time um, and the political work uh, uh, from the political commissars who were always present uh, in each hospital uh, was uh, one of the ways that the free time was filled in and the other was also cultural different kind of cultural activities or amusement uh, so uh, partisan um, theater uh, squads and groups uh, would visit uh, hospitals very often to amuse uh, um, and cheer up uh, the, uh, the uh, staff and uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, the wounded uh, patients. Um, 
but also an information system was very elaborate because people uh, it was very important to keep the spirits up in what was um, going on in the war in general so um, uh, different kinds of newspapers were brought. There were uh, wall, wall newspapers in every hospital that everyone could read. Uh, but there is also something that's called an oral newspaper, Usmene Novine. So many people were illiterate and uh, for order, in order for them to uh, gain the knowledge that could be, that was written in newspapers, they were read out uh, the news. Uh, so in one of the photos, uh, very impressive photos here, you can see the audience of this oral newspaper reading uh, in one of the one of the hospitals. So uh, important element, of course, to say is that these were sites that were very inclusive and that this front was very uh, inclusive for different uh, political spectrum. Uh, there was a clear uh, horizon of the socialist revolution uh, and the political content uh, of the commoning of the welfare, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, it was always also a very uh, inclusive in terms of religious um, uh, symbols, etc. cetera. Um, uh, as a byproduct of uh, the system of medical hair care, there was also the system of uh, health care over the general population. And it was very often the case that people in the, in, in the rural areas uh, where the warfare was going on, um, uh, it was their first chance ever to see a doctor. So in the uh, series of interviews that we are doing in Reznica, we also heard of the stories where, that, where people were, for the first time during um, the, uh, the, organ the presence of the partisan hospital, visiting the hospital and getting uh, some kind of professional advice uh, for um, themselves or their children, children etc. And this uh, link between the medical uh, service for the military and for the civilian was very strong. It depended on each other because as civilians were seeing the benefits of the system, they were more likely to support the partisan movement as well uh, and also to be politically more aware of the relevance uh, of the importance of uh, a different um, a distribution of uh, healthcare uh, for the future. I'm just gonna briefly mention the fact that uh, also a medical healthcare system was relevant in the in the Italian uh, in the in, in Italy after the after the liberation in forty three like temporary liberation and then also in these allied bases in Egypt like El Shat uh, where uh, this medical service was brought to even higher higher level level uh, but was very very important for um, the civilian population that were that were refugees to those um, areas so overall we could say that. There are some statistics that I'm now bringing back the gender aspect into this, that uh, basically with this 5,000, 5,500 uh, uh, within uh, this number, uh, 3,700 uh, 3, partisan nurses um, were killed. It was about 15% of all, all women, uh, both, part, both those that were active in the resistance and that were civilians killed in World War II. And out of them, about almost 2,000 uh, were between 13 and 20 years old. And they were mostly from Croatia, uh, statistically, then from Bosnia and Herzegovina, then less so uh, Serbia, Vojvodina, and you can see the numbers um, here. And then interestingly, the social background, uh, background of these killed partisan nurses uh, is um, that they were mostly housekeepers from rural, rural areas, many of them illiterate. Uh, there were also uh, teachers, workers, um, some students and educators, and then much less so uh, people of the uh, upper class uh, background uh, that would join uh, the partisan uh, struggle. Um, there were four of them honored with the medal of the people's uh, hero after the end of the war. And here I'm just going to show you um, the partisan, uh, the photograph of the partisan hospital number seven on Dre uh, in near Drezhnica, Mount Javornica. 
This is one of the rare surviving photos of the structure. And uh, this is a wider area um, where you can see the partisan camps uh, surrounding the village. And also with the yellow, it's the location of the hospital. Uh, there was a, the strategic um, uh, location of this um, uh, of these facilities, um, and with this, I'm going to uh, transfer to the to the post-war period to the me memory uh, memory of the partisan healthcare. In this uh, photograph, you can see um, very interesting, um, uh, uh, very uh, or maybe we could say very. Um, intriguing um, composition of different uh, sculptures. And the, the dominant one is the sculpture representing a nurse uh, that is covering the wounded or the killed partisan, which will be later installed uh, in um, the vicinity of, the, uh, of this um, hospital in Drezhnica that I um, um, that I, uh, yeah, I, I just saw it on uh, the, uh, yeah, I'm, go I'm going to make it a bit, a bit more, wrap it up a bit more faster. Um, just a second. Okay. So here I'm not going to read all of this, but the, the point is that apart from when we talk about memorialization, we are basically thinking often about monuments and memorials and representation of different kinds uh, through artistic forms, but very often when uh, the former nurses, partisan nurses or medical staff talked about how they could, they were imagining memorialization, they were often basically more inclined to different forms of, um, uh, of memorialization. So a forest itself could be the best memorial for the wounded par uh, partisan nurses or uh, this cherry tree that grew on the site where the children brought uh, cherries, where the hospital was, was some kind of uh, an alternative monument that they could imagine. Um, but let, let's let's go back to this uh, sculpture that I mentioned uh, that I showed at the beginning. This is the moment of the opening of uh, this ossuary that is located close to the hospital in Drezhnica um, uh, with a very official ceremony. Uh, 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 of um, unveiling this sculpture. And uh, this is a basically a case study where we can see how these processes were usually um, taking place. The opening would gather former partisan nurses and physicians um, uh, in an official uh, ceremony. Uh, and then later on, these monuments would take on their own lives. Uh, and uh, after the... Um, uh, after the socialist uh, uh, period and with the uh, with the num numerous other problems, we have the situation that these monuments were very often um, forgotten uh, or uh, just uh, stolen uh, and destroyed. But still, um, they uh, have uh, an importance for the local community. Um, and obviously, there were much more elaborate scope of monuments and memorialization practices related to the um, to the sites of, of hospitals, and very different in in their formal characteristics. Some of them we are not even associating with hospitals, as they were uh, intended to be universal abstract uh, symbols, uh, and they were basically devoid of that of their original meanings. And in, and in case of Drezhnica, there was a, an idea, initial idea to make a replica of the, of, the, uh, of the hospital building. But in the end, there was another approach uh, taken uh, with an architect, uh, Zdenko Kolacios project that is only marking uh, the contours of the buildings, um, creating some kind of scenography uh, of the hospital. And this is how the site uh, looks today. Later on, we also have this practice of making memorial areas, uh, wider uh, protected areas that were supposed to uh, uh, memorialize the um, whole liberated areas and protect them. Uh, and also the practice of uh, making little museums uh, or collections, the local museums or collections that uh, were um, uh, also, yeah, uh, reminding uh, that will serve as an education centers and memorialization centers for 
uh, these hospitals. There were also uh, more elaborate exhibitions um, and different types of um, uh, hospitals uh, that we can see. More recently, uh, we see that the, this um, uh, impulse of caring and taking care of heritage of some stories and narratives that got lost uh, in the last 30 years or so uh, also got into artistic practice uh, as a system of caring for um, materiality of the monuments themselves, uh, which I also find very interesting. And at the end, I'm just going to briefly go through what we are doing in Drezhnitz, as you're already now acquainted with this um, area, um, and with uh, to bring back um, for a second Diela Jancic, who was the political commissar of that uh, hospital and who wrote a book and made a survey in the 70s, in the 60s, uh, about that area, starting to mem memorialize it. What we did at the site of the monument and the hospital was that we entered that we, with the knowledge provided by the local population, we also entered the caves that were housed, that were housing the um, uh, probably pharmacy and um, uh, shelter for the wounded. Uh, and we managed to document some of these uh, objects there, creating some kind of a 3D model of the um, uh, cave uh, hospital, uh, how we usually refer to it, and also, also extracting material that is telling us also about some of the aspects that I mentioned, that these glass were, were from the partisan hospital were, for example, Italian origin, that they were taken uh, from Italians. Also, that the cross, the Red Cross, and the aid that was coming from the Allies in the 1944 that were taken to, uh, that were parachuted to the local community are now preserved in some, of, in, in a way, preserved in some of these households uh, with a different surface. This is a um, cart for uh, the medical supplies uh, parachuted from the US aid. Uh, and we are also uh, trying to mediate this uh, materiality of the hospital with the local community and learning from them. We are also concerned with the presence of the um, refugees in need of care uh, in that area. And we are kind of trying to find ways to uh, speak of the actual uh, um, humanitarian crisis um, uh, by uh, uh, working on the materiality of the World War II uh, and heritage of the World War II, uh, and also gathering the community around the sites, making, making it easier for them to uh, renovate some of the memorials that they, were, that they lost and that were lost uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the period uh, of the last 30, year, 30 years or so. Um, and here I just uh, have the list of literature which is much longer and I might conclude here and we can have a discussion. Thank you, Sanya. Um, okay, so before we go to uh, the questions, uh, I would just encourage audience that they either write their questions in uh, the chat on Facebook or uh, here on Zoom um, or if they wish to open their microphone and pose question and show their face, that would be also uh, uh, a welcome gesture. Okay, Rui joins us. <laughs> um, okay, uh, maybe a, a question uh, to you, Sanya, uh, just to break the ice a little bit and uh, maybe to bring the two talks uh, into a dialogue. Um, what I was thinking, you initially said that um, a reform or transformation of the uh, public health uh, healthcare system prior to the Second World War was very much the work of political progressives. And uh, obviously, now um, Stampar had huge influence on reforming uh, the, the very or forming the very notion, founding the very notion of public health. Um, is a concern. So uh, what I would be interested to hear is uh, obviously uh, in the conditions of guerrilla warfare, particularly on, uh, um, on the front, uh, these were highly uh, degraded conditions of uh, survival, uh, not only in immediate uh, sort of engagement, uh, but 
uh, also just uh, living in, in the woods uh, outside of sheltered areas, really very, very extreme conditions of public health. Um, uh, so the question would be uh, whether there was uh, any research done on uh, how medical professionals cared for uh, the, the general condition of both the army and, and I guess the civilian population uh, in liberated areas uh, from sort of an encompassing healthcare perspective. Obviously, there was a lot of wounded that needed or people um, affected by infections and, and mm -hmm. acute conditions, uh, but uh, was there a general notion of uh, uh, health as a condition and uh, if this mm. was formulated? Yes, I think uh, I, 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 it seems to me that you are asking about the um, measures for preventing um, worse uh, medical conditions, basically. I mean, it was as it was. There was a war going on. There were many wounded people, and the people who lived in that that area, those areas, most of the rural areas, were already living in uh, very bad conditions. I mean, we have also surveys from the 30s that are showing not only literacy levels but also the levels of like what was the conditions that people lived in. Uh, and Kakoživi uh, Narod, for example, of Bichanić and other uh, literature and, 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 and specialists were doing and were also like were very much concerned with that. So we, this is what was the, the general situation when the war broke out. So already bad uh, conditions were met by extreme violence and by extreme um, level of, of physical um, um, uh, disabilities of different kinds that were uh, needed to be taken care of. And obviously it was very difficult to organize it. This is what I was also um, t uh, talking about. But yeah, there was a very high level of awareness of how to uh, prevent, for example, diseases that were spreading to spread further. So epidemiological service was very much um, in charge and very important. There were a lot of um, propaganda, medical propaganda done by the by other partisan services like the Agitprop uh, that were educating in very um, simple ways uh, with very uh, um, effective slogans uh, to people telling them uh, how to, you know, combat and beat uh, this um, diseases. Um, so this was like the first maybe impulses of how to 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 care uh, about uh, the popul the wider population and how um, the disease uh, is uh, the, the different kinds of um, infections that was typhus mo most predominantly at the time uh, how it is a collective concern and how it must be uh, fought uh, literally uh, as the iconography was in those posters uh, fought. Uh, against basically the same as against the fascists. So this kind of um, rhetoric was very strong and very important. And epidemiologists and epidemiological um, service was part of these congresses that I met, uh, that I mentioned, and that were um, integrated in the system from this from the beginning. So the system, for example, of washing the clothes so it was not only uh, you couldn't wash wash the clothes all, always but you could uh, disinfect it uh, with steam so this um, machinery um, of bure <laughs> i don't know how to translate it it was kind of a battle um, that would steam uh, clothes so it was a uh, regular uh, instruction uh, that whenever a partisan comes to the hospital, for example, uh, the clothes needs to be taken off, steamed, disinfected, and then uh, he was ready to enter. There were also in as part of the um, uh, these complexes of, of uh, uh, hospitals, there was always also um, the um, quarantine uh, department uh, also. So um, yeah. I, I don't know if I answered, but <laughs> if... yeah, this is a very general question. But um, I'm also 
I think it's also uh, uh, an approach to providing healthcare that would then roll over into the post-war period where the concern would be uh, for uh, the degraded conditions in which the masses lived. And that uh, dovetails with uh, also the conditions of the factory where most of the working class was living in, in degraded conditions that were beyond the, the, the factory. They, were, they yeah. also extended into uh, social reproduction. Um, there was a question though uh, about the literature. So the person is asking if uh, you could share uh, the literature list. Um, so maybe what would in that literature list be key references for you? Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, well, for me, um... I mean, there is a general general literature that is basically the four volumes of the um, Sanitet ka služba u Enobel, um, which is all uh, already digitized uh, and uh, available on Znaci, although Znaci.net uh, is uh, not functional, but you have the archive. Anyway, I can send you the PDFs of that, of those volumes. This is a very, the most comprehensive, basically, uh, um, literature on um, different different aspects uh, of the um, uh, healthcare in partisans and in different republics with many statistics. So most of these statistics uh, that I showed were taken from there. Um, and also uh, interesting collection of photographs, although, although they are not high quality. There is also on znati.net when it functioned, um, and I hope it will again. There is a, a big collection of photo uh, archives. There is a photo archive of the um, uh, Museum of Revolution of the people of Yugoslavia with uh, very nice um, uh, images uh, from um, also related to um, and the um, military sanitation and the healthcare system in World War II. But uh, yeah, for me personally, uh, yeah, obviously it is the Little Red Book by Jela Jancic Starts, uh, who was the political commissar of the partisan number no. seven in Drežnica. And um, yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I'm now kind of like intrigued to look more into these continuities, especially of women activism before the war, during the war, and then after the war, and how these concerns were continually present in their, um, uh, in their, um, yeah, in whatever they were doing, basically. Um, for example, I, this is why I also mentioned this alternate ways of memorializing and of like um, activating um, knowledge in the sites of memory. So Yela's proposal, she was uh, um, an agronomist by uh, profession. Uh, and her uh, proposal for the site of the monument where the hospital was, was also to make a botanical garden uh, for, uh, with the, um, um, the plants that they used um, to make medicines and different kinds of yeah, uh, herbal um, um, yeah, uh, liquids and whatever they use. So it was a way also of like passing on this knowledge that is not only um, that it that, that was basically uh, also a result of working with the local community because this is the knowledge that was carried on uh, in in the local communities. It's kind of like. Um, alternative medicine uh, that was necessary uh, under those conditions. And um, this kind of um, uh, little um, marginal notes in this book, for example, are very, were very valuable to me. Great. Uh, Valeria asked me to pass the ball a bit to her, but uh, I'm going to come back to a question of um, women in uh, uh, organizing healthcare and work. Well, yeah. um, thanks. Uh, no, I just had a remark. I suppose that um, I'd be interested to hear, Sanya, what you think about that uh, in the sense of uh, in, in the histories where that I was um, looking at in Italy uh, uh, around building um, 
health as a right or better yet uh, it is written in the constitution as a right but to activate that into a, a, a structure uh, infrastructure and uh, instituting um, many many of the key protagonists were um, part of the italian resistance uh, not particularly as doctors i must say they were uh, partisans uh, fighting in in the brigade and um, and this in a way um, informs um, a very interesting, uh, I think, framing of uh, discussions around care that started to come hunting us uh, recently, uh, unfortunately, with this uh, recent bigger, maybe more visible wave of revisionism, whereby a lot of the claims in Italy, I'm, I'm really now specifically addressing that context, claimed that uh, you know it was bad and, and, and so forth, but they were the first ones to provide uh, social, some kind of idea of welfare uh, state. And, and, and there is some merit to that claim, but it is obviously a very specific idea of what social workers are there to achieve uh, and, and a very specific idea of care and society that comes up comes out of a, a fascist uh, notion of the state as an intervention in, in people's health regimes and uh, that goes from uh, practicing sports as this of course this uh, glorified idea of the healthy individual all the way down to uh, the first, uh, I think Mussolini uh, created the proper social workers to visit factories to check on the workers' health, but obviously it was in a very different key politically, you know. And and so I I'm I'm fascinated with this nexus between what happens during the war. The, the the broader questions on that, that also motivated the people to join resistance to begin with no um so some uh, i didn't mention this but uh Ivar Odone, for example this uh, doctor on which i focus my talk he was the protagonist of uh not, not the protagonist, it was one of the characters of one of the most important books uh, on the partisan resistance by italo calvino Mm -hmm. called uh, the path of the spider's nests um, and uh, the book is also dedicated to him they fought together they were friends throughout history uh, throughout their lives Calvino being one of the most important uh, writers uh, of the, the second half of the uh, 1900s in the country and uh, yeah Nodone was uh, named with this uh, battle name of Kim and uh, the nexus that has been made is that uh, in the book, the character, but apparently modeled on, on real behavior, he was really much asking all the other partisans of various social classes and backgrounds, rural areas and so forth, uh, many questions to find out what motivated them in their practical life to join anti-fascism, what was their vision of life, uh, what is a good life in society and so forth. And then after the war, this returns a lot in the methodology that Odone thinks about in terms of actually asking the factory workers, what is your idea of good health and what is bad in your work uh, environment? So I don't know, it's not mm -hmm. probably a question, I suppose it's more in the spirit of uh, uh, kind of joint discussion and remarks, mm -hmm. but I'm very fascinated by this link uh, in between the exceptional time of war and what happens in, yeah. in the reconstruction era, so yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting and I think that a lot of like research needs to be done and thinking about this needs to be done yet uh, we have a lot like as I said there is a lot of literature there is a lot of kind of basic um, facts about this system in Yugoslavia but the way that it is interpreted from our perspective today it's it's really it's really relevant that we need to look in, in, in into those uh, into those book uh, books and dig them out and also not on, not only books but uh, as i suggested also materiality of those sites to think through some of the questions that we have today and i what, what you were saying it reminded me um, of something i wanted to mention but i didn't have time in my talk um, 
of uh, you know that introductory introductory um, uh, quote from the from the newspaper that was describing the like basically idealistic uh, view of how this uh, hospital function and how everything was in harmony uh only i think a month or two after that i have a document a very interesting one for the same hospital uh it is like a political um, uh, report uh, of a, a partisan visiting the site and reporting on the higher level what is the situation in the in the hospital and he is very unhappy and he's mainly unhappy with um, the, the the situation uh, of the political awareness, uh, what was how it was uh, described uh, in the hospital, and he 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 said he says that the uh, the political commissar who was supposed to be in charge of talking to people about uh, what are the you know political goals of the re resistance, what is maybe even the idea of um, uh, healthcare and what, of the future society, etc., was not doing his job properly, and the people there was a lot of disorientation, political disorientation in the hospital. And then he also mentioned that there was uh, um, uh, uh, some kind of um, um, a problem uh, argument between the political commissar and uh, the, the the physician who was in charge of the hospital who was running the hospital because obviously this guy the the doctor was um, probably a reactionary no and he was not he was there because he was a physician many of them came to the to the front as i said they were kidnapped they were taken they couldn't or th there was less evil for them so it depended on different different motivation for joining and for coming to these liberated uh, territories it wasn't only about you know idealistic aims of uh, revolution many of them were just for example um jewish doctors they were saving their lives uh, by joining the partisans they were not communists necessarily they were from upper class background often etc uh so um there was this uh the, this interest there is this interesting you know other perspective on the same hospital from uh, the political um, uh, way of analyzing things. And I think that in that way, uh, it is, yeah, you know, organization of the collective healthcare, yeah, it can be, uh, it can, uh, uh, it can have different political um, aims and connotations. So what they were very much concerned about really was to keep the political agenda alive and to, to fight, um, uh, constantly observe and to try to uh, fight the the negative uh, phenomena happening in the in those collectives. Maybe to go back to you announced that uh, in in the announcement of your talk, you suggested that minorities were important in uh, organizing uh, medical services uh, on the front and. Um, a couple of months, maybe a year, a year ago, um, I was asked by a Polish artist, Susanna Herzberg, uh, about the trajectory of Braina Rudina, uh, Rudina Foss, who was uh, a partner of Alfred Bergman. Um, and she was uh, a Jew who uh, arrived to Yugoslavia and spent the period from 33 to 36, at which point she goes to uh, uh, to, to the Spanish War, uh, but in this period she was really very active as a medical doctor within the communist uh, circles. Uh, so I guess um, as soon as this, uh, the independent state of Croatia is established in 41, uh, many uh, Serbs and Jews are forced to uh, take it to the woods and, and uh, find uh, yeah. sort of uh, security and, and, and uh, active role in resisting uh, uh, the Nazi regime. So um, if you can just elaborate a little bit about the, the, this, this subjectivation of, of uh, these people in the war. I mean, uh, in many ways, uh, resistance was organized by the Communist Party, but as well by the mem uh, sort of members of minorities, prosecuted minorities that had nowhere to go and uh, 
uh, were put in uh, an extreme condition where they had to mobilize or perish. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the things I can I can mention two two instances. Um, uh, one of the things that I found striking when I was now preparing for this uh, is the fact that, for example, um, it is mentioned that the, the situation radically improved um, uh, when uh, the camp uh, for um, uh, Jewish prisoners on the island of Rab was liberated mm -hmm. in '43 with the capitulation of Italy. And uh, it is well known that they also formed the, the Jewish brigade, the partisan brigade. Uh, and many of these people were of um, uh, um, some kind of a upper, uh, higher education background and many were also doctors. So these people joined the partisans. They were they very soon, they, they left the island and they joined the partisans and they were uh, also joining the hospitals. So this is very interesting for me, like that this instant, you know, this historical moment is bringing uh, this benefit for the partisan um, resistance. And uh, it is a question of whether, what, what kind of political orientation these people had before the war. I mean, they were just imprisoned there because they were um, Jew Jews um, and also Slavic people were uh, imprisoned in the same, uh, in a different department of the same camp. Um, uh, and uh, this is one thing that uh, that comes to my mind uh, when we think about this. And the other one is more of a, a personal uh, story, and uh, that I that I also developed uh, with one woman who uh, was a nurse in the Partisan Hospital Number Nine, uh, Number Seven in uh, Dreznica, and whom I recognize in one of the photos. Uh, and uh, I learned uh, that she still that she was still alive in Zagreb at the time. She passed away, unfortunately, last year. And uh, she she then uh, told me we we made an interview, and she told me uh, her story. So she was basically, uh, yeah, a, a Jewish person, uh, a girl. Uh, she was like eighteen or or so uh, when the war started uh, in Zagreb, and her family was persecuted. She was hiding in Zagreb for a while, like a, a legal 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 person. Uh, and then she managed to, with, because her, her sister was part of the SCOI uh, of the communist youth, she managed to get fake ID and to, to leave Zagreb. Because as I said before, it was difficult to leave the, the occupied territories. It wasn't just joining the partisans. You, you couldn't leave after a, a certain uh, period uh, when they closed um, the city. Um, so she, she managed to leave and then she joined, uh, then she joined the partisans in the literal in Primoria. And then she ended up in uh, Dreznica and she, she was there for like a year or so as a nurse. She wasn't a nurse before, she was just, she went to high school, uh, but she was ready to do that. I mean, she was already uh, <laughs> capable of, uh, of doing uh, whatever was needed. And the very interesting um, thing about her biography and what she told me was that she couldn't, she just couldn't wait to leave hospital and to join the units. She 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 hated being in the hospital. She it was like the the the, the most um, difficult task and labor uh, that she had to you know. So it was. Uh, yeah, it was like meeting constant um, uh, infections, uh, which is which was very um, risky for everyone working there. Uh, she also had typhus, but she lived. Uh, she managed to survive, um, and also lo a lot of physical labor uh, the whole day, uh, and also of course uh, psychological um, impact of looking at people dying every day. Um, so she was just eager to leave uh, uh, the hospital and to join a partisan unit. And she, in the end, she, uh, she managed to do it. So it was very often the case that, that people also, like all people, but women, including, including women, were uh, also moving from hospital to units and doing different things during the war. It was not only um, uh, like one task, uh, professionalized uh, work. Um, so yeah, basically her Jewish background and this story uh, is quite telling in terms of how the resistance, the organized resistance enabled um, uh, Jewish uh, people, but also Serbian minority and Roma minority to, to some extent to survive by joining 
uh, by joining the resistance. And yeah, regarding the motivation, it was a very, very wide scope. We would, we shouldn't be like so um, idealistic to think of that everyone who was in those hospitals was, was like, uh, you know, um, there with uh, the same uh, political goals or awareness of what's going on. Many of them were just surviving and many of them were just like basically uh, yeah, doing their, the best they can. Uh, in the in, in in those horrible circumstances. Yeah, Thank please. God. Otherwise, it would be exactly like a fascist idea of society where everyone <laughs> thinks the same. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. I guess uh, subjectivation uh, frequently emerges from dire conditions, and not vice vice versa. And all that subjectivity is already there, and it's met. Uh, it's meeting uh, dire conditions. I guess that's also the question about the factory and subjectivation, where the tacit knowledge produced by the collectivity of workers uh, is uh, something created out of necessity. And that what, in a way, constructs the collectivity, uh, it's the condition that they meet and they're put into. Um, so uh, in that sense, that's, that's uh, uh, where um, capacity to uh, work toward care uh, can emerge in such uh, situations. Uh, that would be a way to view it. Okay, uh, um, there are no questions from the audience uh, from what I can see. Uh, so maybe if we should we should close it here. Uh, I'd like to thank Valeria uh, for jumping in and, and carrying uh, out this time uh, from childcare. Uh, Matt is uh, uh, being, uh, in a way, uh, denied uh, your presence uh, these evenings, but okay. Uh, and thank you, Sanya, uh, for joining us uh, tonight and for this uh, uh, talk. Uh, rich in, in details and, and uh, research, uh, but also in perspective. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our uh, attendees, uh, both here on Zoom and uh, on Facebook. And uh, uh, last but not least, I would uh, um, wish that sort of send uh, best vibes to Madalena that she recovers uh, quickly. So thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Yes. You too. Thank you, Tom, for organizing everything, Valeria also, and for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I'm also sorry that we couldn't, um, I mean, that there was not maybe more of a like um, coherence to the seminar from the last, from yesterday and from today to bring some things together. But there could be another like uh, follow up, <laughs> I guess. I think we were not. Uh, striving for coherency. I think that the idea is uh, more like surveying as in the spirit of the exhibition itself, uh, st different stories from different moments uh, and that can be conversation starters into the now, but without doing an event on the pandemic. Yeah, which yeah. I think we need m other venues to uh, have conversations around. So hopefully this can inspire different points of entry in all these questions. So, yeah. yeah. And hopefully returning to in-person uh, events will allow yeah. also for the surround that happens before and after and uh, yeah. the spillover from the first to the second day and from uh, the barrier of the speakers to the audience uh, to happen. So uh holding fingers crossed for that for all of us right okay thank you again good night bye, everyone bye bye yeah.